Hello everyone, I'm going to do a walkthrough of the CIE IGCC Biology 0610 Summer 2015 Paper 11. So that's the multiple choice paper. I'm going to go through each question and see um, what the correct answer is and then um, how I would answer it and how I think about it and, and why, why the correct answer is correct. Okay, so we're going to go on to the first question. So the diagram illustrates some of the processes carried out by living organisms. And you can see um, uh, all, the, all these items, oxygen of the atmosphere and light energy and waste products and the areas of the direction of energy flow into a green plant and then the direction of energy flow to a chicken and then direction of uh, energy flow carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and waste products. Um, and then you have to answer what is the characteristics of the living organism is represented by arrow X. Um, so this is going from a green plant to a chicken. So the green plant being eaten by the chicken essentially to make it into chicken rather than green plant. Um, so excretion, that would be the um, removal of, of, of waste from the, from the from the chicken. So that would be that would be, that would be this, this arrow. So it's not that. So it's not not excretion. Nutrition. So that would be the chicken eating. So that is this arrow. This is going from a green plant, energy in the green plant, to the chicken. So this is eating. So, it, so it's got a so this, this is so nutrition must be the right answer. Respiration. Respiration um, is the process of turning this green plant into energy for the chicken. So we're turning turning once it's been eaten by the chicken and become part of the chicken, then turn into energy for the chicken to use, which produces carbon dioxide, which is this arrow, so that's C. Um, so this is C, this is A, this is B. And then sensitivity is uh, not labeled here, but that would be like um, sensing the environment, that would be completely different. So B is the correct answer. Question two, what is the correct way of naming a species according to the binomial system? So this is um, the system where you give something its genus and its species, in two words, and it, it differentiates it from any other organism. Um, and we have to remember with, this, with the binomial system, you want a capitalized first letter of, of the genus. So the genus needs a capitalized first letter. It's got to be in italics, it's got to be in Latin, and it's got to have two words. So it can't be this, that's, that's one word, it's not italics, but it is in Latin. This is two words, but it doesn't have a capitalized first letter, and it's not in Latin. And that's like the common name for, for humans. Um, so it's not these two. Um, and then both of these are Homo sapiens. Um, but this one has a capitalized, in, in italics, in Latin. This one has a capitalized species name, and this one doesn't have a capitalized species name. If you remember, if you remember the um, species name is not capitalized, but the genus name, so the homo, is capitalized. So that's this. So A is the correct answer. The diagram shows four arthropods. How many of these arthropods are insects? So the thing you've got to remember here is um, that one of the easy things to remember here is that insects have six legs. And if you look here, this one has six legs, three pairs of legs, in fact. This one has three, pair, three pairs of legs, one, two, three pairs of legs. Whereas this one has one, two, three, four pairs of legs. And this one also has one, two, three, four pairs of legs. So these two are not insects, whereas these two are insects. So the correct answer is 2B. The key, number, question four. The key can be used to distinguish between four different chemical substances. Use the key to identify which substance could be a protein. So you have to have, for this question, you have to know a little bit about proteins, know a little bit about their characteristics, and then you have to know how to use this key. So starting with number one, we're going to say the element contains, it contains the element carbon, or does not contain the element carbon. So if you remember proteins, they're made of carbon, um, with a uh, uh, amino, amino group on one end um, and uh, a hydroxyl group on the other end, and then they have an R group and uh, and uh, um, hydrogen on the central carbon. And this set, and you can see that the element it does contain they do contain um, they contain carbon, and uh, this is an amino acid, and proteins are made of lots of amino acids. So yeah, it does contain the element carbon. So we can say yes to that, that's wrong. So go to two. So it's not A, we've ruled out A, go to two. Contains the element nitrogen, does not contain nitrogen. So as we said, proteins are made of uh, amino acids. Amino acids have this amino group in which has nitrogen. So it does contain nitrogen. So the great B, not, we don't want to go to three. So we can rule out all these. A Benedict's test that will be reducing for reducing sugars. Um, so that's something else you could look out for. If you're, if you're testing something with a Benedict's test for a protein, um, uh, it won't tell you whether it's protein or not, but it will tell you whether, whether it's a sugar or not. Question five. The diagram shows two guard cells from a leaf. Which labeled part, 
would also be found in liver, cell, liver cells. And so we look at these labels. A is labeling this dark blob, which recommends the nucleus. B is labeling this, this round thing. You can't really tell from this diagram whether that's a chloroplast or a mitochondria, but we have to assume that it's a chloroplast. C is labeling this space in the middle, that's our vacuole. And D is labeling this, the extracellular space where the cell wall sits, so that's the cell wall. So this is our cell membrane here. And in this space, we have a cell, this is our cell wall the space here. It's nice and thick and strengthened and gives the cell, gives, gives the cell some structure. So a cell wall, that's, that's made of cellulose, it's only present in, present in um, plants, we can pull that one out. Vacuole, that's our sap in the middle of the cell, that's only present in, well, basically only present in plants. It's only, there are only big vacuoles present in plants. Chloroplasts, they, they do photosynthesis, they're not present in animals at all. So our, and our nucleus, that contains DNA, that's present in all um, eukaryotes. So that's, so A is the correct answer. The diagram shows part of a leaf in cross-section. Structures X and Y are both part of the same cell, organ, tissue, or vessel. So if you think about a leaf, a leaf is a, organ, a plant organ, it's the photosynthetic organ. Um, and we have each of these are the individual cells. So this is, this is one cell, this is one cell, this is one cell, this is one cell, etc. I'm just going to change the blue to a bit more obvious while I'm writing. And so this, is, we've got like, labeled a palisade cell, is X. We've got labeled a gar cell, is, is Y. They're definitely not the same cell, so we can, we, we can rule that one out. Um, this is all one organ. So this is all, all the leaf, all one organ. So they are definitely part of the same, same organ. So we can, B is correct. And tissue, so each of these types of cell, same cell, cell types is one tissue. So all these palisade cells make one tissue. All the cells on the surface of the leaf make it excrete the waxy cuticle, they make one tissue. Uh, all of these spongy mesophyll um, cells, they make another tissue. And then these um, pavement cells at the bottom, they make another, another tissue. Uh, and then the guard cells are another cell type. Um, so it's not going to be tissue. And vessel, well, there isn't really any vessel shown in here. This, this might, might be considered a vessel, but this might be a vein. But um, they're basically spaces between cells. There is no vessel in here, so we can, in this diagram, so it's got to be organ. It's the correct answer. Question seven. The diagram shows a plant cell. Um, what features show that it is a plant cell? As a cell wall and a vacuole. So we know from the other question that a cell wall and a vacuole are both features of a plant cell. It has a nucleus and a cytoplasm. They are features of a plant cell, but they're also a feature of an animal cell. So that doesn't tell us, tell us it's specifically a plant cell. It just tells us it's a, it's a eukaryote. It's got a nucleus. It tells us it's a eukaryotic cell. Um, it has a nucleus, but no chloroplasts. So a nucleus, again, that's, that's, um, that tells us it's a eukaryotic cell, but no chloroplasts. Remember, that's, that's an animal cell, so it can't be seen. It has a chloroplast, but no vacuole. Um, again, vacuoles um, tend to be present in all plant cells. The fact it's got chloroplast, but no vacuole might mean that it's an algae um, or a photosynthetic um, bacteria. So that doesn't tell us that it's specifically a plant. But this one, these are key features of a plant cell, which are not present in other, other, to other organism types. So it's, it's, the answer is A. In a section through a plant, a student found a group of long microscopic structures. The structures lacked end walls, cytoplasm, and nuclei. Which identification and reason best matches the student observations? So you've got these two things. So it says long microscopic structures, the structures lacked end walls, cytoplasm, and nuclei. So immediately, this should be screaming out at you, xylem or flowing vessel. So probably xylem vessel. Because the xylem vessels, remember, they are made of lignified dead cells, so the water can pass straight up through them, and they have these supporting cells on the side. And um, so it's not going to be root hair cells, and it's not. So we can we can rule out A and B already. Um, so xylem vessels. Um, uh, the reason why do they have no cytoplasm? Um, no, so the function of the xylem vessel is to carry water and minerals. Um, they do also offer some support, but their primary function is to carry water and minerals. So this is the correct answer. They need to carry out water, carry water efficiently. Um, so uh, D is the correct answer. The diagram shows a specialized cell cut in half. What does this diagram indicate about the structure of the cell? This extra cell has a cell wall. So if we look at this, there doesn't seem to be any evidence for a cell wall. If this is a back, the back of the cell, 
this is the, the the membrane here, and you can see there's nothing no, nothing nothing external supporting the the, um, the membrane. It's just got just got this membrane, and um, so it's not got a cell wall, so we can rule that out. The cell is concave at each side. We can see that from here. This is concave. So yeah, that's that's correct. The cell is long and thin. The cell is not long and thin. This is a cross cut in half. The full cell is going to be round um, and and concave. So it's going to have kind of a dip down the middle. Um, that's not a very good diagram. You know that. Um, so um, the cell is so the cell is not long and thin. The cell is red and carries oxygen. So this could be a diagram. Probably is it supposed to be a diagram of a red blood cell? But we can't we can't see it being red, and we don't know where it comes oxygen from this diagram. You could you could infer that. But if you think it's a red blood cell, you might know that it's red and carries oxygen. But that's you can't you can't indicate that from this diagram. So B is the correct answer. Question ten. How do carbon dioxide and oxygen move in and out of a mesophyll cell? Actually, transport, diffusion, respiration, or transpiration. So, um, uh, active. Um, you've got to remember that carbon dioxide and oxygen can't be moved actively; they just diffuse through cell membranes. So, both of them acting into the cell against the concentration gradient would um, just cause them to back out. So, it can't be that. Diffusion. Diffusion is the correct answer. Um, that's um, carbon dioxide and, and oxygen do diffuse into cells. Respiration. Respiration is what uses up oxygen and produces carbon dioxide, but it's not how they move in and out of the cell. And transpiration is the process of moving water up the plant, up the plant, and then out from, from the roots, up the plant, through the xylem vessels, and then out through the stomata. But that's not how carbon dioxide moves. So B is the correct answer. During osmosis, which molecules move and well, which molecules move and through which type of membrane? So osmosis, remember that osmosis is basically the diffusion of water. So water is our moving molecule. So it can't be A or B. And then type of membrane, um, it's got to be in order to um, the, the movement of water has to be down in order to dilute a substance on one side. So you've got a high concentration here. So X, this is a high concentration, and we've got a low concentration, so a small X for a low concentration. The water's going to move, and this is this pet membrane and the other membrane is permeable with water. The water's going to move down here in order to even out the concentration. If the, if the membrane is completely permeable, which is basically there's no membrane at all, then X can move as well, and the water won't move, the X will move instead um, to even out the concentration gradient. So you've got to be a partially permeable membrane. You've got to, you've got to create this gradient in order to make water to move. The partially permeable is the correct answer. So C is the correct answer. The diagram shows an experiment on the digestion of protein and egg albumin of the protease. The protease was taken from a human stomach. Which test tube will the protein be digested? In which test tube will the protein be digested most quickly? Um, egg, just egg albumin. So it's all we held at 37 degrees. So these are all at the same temperature in the same water bath. Egg albumin plus protease. Egg albumin plus dilute hydro hydrochloric. Acid, egg albumin plus dilute hydrochloric acid plus protease, egg albumin plus dilute hydrochloric acid plus boiled protease. So, egg albumin plus protease, it would, the protease will work a little bit, but if it's from the human stomach, the human stomach is pH of one or even, even less than one. Um, so, that's really, really acidic. It's actually got quite a lot, quite a lot of, quite a, quite a strong, quite a high concentration, quite a lot of hydrochloric acid in it's actually pumped out. Actually, pumped out the lining of the stomach, and um, it could be really dangerous if that hydrochloric gets in the wrong hydrochloric acid gets in the wrong place. But it's really good at digesting um, uh, bacteria and stopping you getting infected. Um, so this is going to work all right, but not brilliant. Egg albumin plus dilute hydrochloric acid. Um, uh, the dilute hydrochloric acid doesn't do very much to digest albumin, and um, so that's not going to be that's not going to be great. That's probably going to be worse than this one. Egg albumin albumin plus dilute hydrochloric acid plus protease. So this is essentially like the stomach. The stomach is designed to work with actually not very dilute, but quite a lot of hydrochloric acid, egg albumin and protease. Um, so that's, this is basically like the stomach. So the protease is well adapted for this. It's going to work really well. It's going to work better than this. So it can't be this. This is currently the best. And egg albumin plus dilute hydrochloric acid plus boiled protease. The boiled protease is going to be denatured and not going to work at all. So this is going to be as good as this one. So it's not really this one. So C is the correct answer. Which effect does a gradual decrease from pH of 13 to 1 have on the action of amylase? 
A slows it down, B slows it down and then speeds it up, C speeds up only, speeds it up and then slows it down. So think about pH, 13 is quite alkaline and one is really very, well, very alkaline and one is very acidic. And amylase, now amylase is a starch digestin enzyme in saliva in the mild mouth. So saliva is slightly alkaline, but it's like probably pH 6 or something, pH 6.5. So, so amylase is going to work optimally at pH 6.5. So if you think about our graph of enzyme activity, against pH, uh, amylase is, is optimal at about pH 6, let's say. So this is pH 1, this is pH 13, and this is going to be its high point. So as you go away from pH 6, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's, and as you go away from pH 6 in the other direction, it's also going to get worse and worse and worse. So we start at pH 13 here, and we move this way. Then the effectiveness is going to increase to here, and then it's going to decrease down to here, to, to, to almost nothing. So we're going to speed up and then slow down. So the correct answer is D, speeds up and then it slows down. The diagram represents a protein molecule. What do the small circles represent? Amino acids, fatty acids, glycerol, or super and simple sugars. So remember from earlier, proteins are made of amino acids. So um, each of these represents an amino acid held together by a peptide bond. So amino acid is the correct answer. Poor nutrition can lead to a condition, condition called rickets, in which bones fail to develop properly. The table shows some minerals and vitamins present in four foods. Which food would be best for a child who has rickets? So remember that um, rickets is caused by a deficiency in vitamin D. Um, and um, Vitamin D requires, uh, which requires calcium to be absorbed, to be to be synthesized in the skin. So we need to, to deliver vitamin D and calcium in order to treat rickets. So which one of these has vitamin? Because we need calcium, so it's going to be one of these two. Iron and vitamin C we can ignore; it doesn't really matter. We need vitamin D, so, we, so it's got to be this one. So it's got to be B. B is the correct answer. Which components make up most of the dry mass of a balanced diet? Calcium common, compounds, carbohydrates and fat. Carbohydrates, fats and proteins. Fats, proteins and vitamins. Proteins, vitamins and calcium compounds. So most of the dry mass, that means most of the stuff you eat. And most of the stuff you eat is providing with energy. Um, and the things that provide you energy are calcium, proteins, and fat. Not calcium. Carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Calcium and the protein, calcium and vitamins and minerals have to be eaten. They are essential. Well, so most, some of them are essential, um, but uh, they're not needed. They're only needed in very small amounts, milligram quantities normally. So B, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins is the correct answer. Which is most of the dry mass. Of the, of the dry mass is the critical bit there. The diagram shows a plant juice in the same juice six hours later. So this one plant juice, six hours later. Which change in the environmental condition could cause this change in the shoot? Decrease in available water, decrease in light intensity, decrease in wind speed, and increase in humidity. So in this short period, to see the plant has become wilted, which means that um, the cells inside the plant have become flaccid because they have less water. So remember, if, you, if your cell is turgid, it has lots of water, You've got your cell, your, your cytoplasm pushing up against it. This is pushing out with lots of pressure against the cell wall, holding it nice and sturdy. Whereas if your cell wall, if your cell wall has kind of a, a, a flaccid plant cell and the, the cytoplasm is kind of hanging off it like this, just attached in small in small places, then the pressure is not going to be providing support, and the cell is going to be much um, going to be can provide less less um, physical kind of strength for the plant. So decreasing available water would cause, cause this transition from turgid to flaccid. Um, so A is the correct answer. Eighteen. The diagram shows four different stages in one heartbeat. What is the correct order of stages after P? So, seeing this one, we have blood coming in into the into the right heart. Remember, when you draw a diagram of a heart, 
at the, the side with more muscle is always the left side, so that's pumping to the side of the body. And also you tend to draw, you, the, the convention is that you draw the heart from the, um, as if you were looking at it from kind of behind the person, as if you were kind of the, the, the person um, who holds the heart. So blood enters, remember, uh, en enters the um, atria and then goes through the valve, the atria ventricular valves. So that's this stage, atria ventricular valves, valves next. Um, into the ventricles. These valves then have to shut and blood is pumped out. And then, then blood can flow back towards the heart into these ventricles and then we get back to Q. Um, so P and then blood enters the ventricles, R. So go to be one of these two. You can rule out these two. Um, and then the next stage is the ventricles contract, so that the blood moves out, so that's Q, it's got to be B, and then S is the last one that's left, and then the, the ventricles start to, the blood starts to flow back towards refilling the ventricles. So you go P, R, Q, S, and back to P. Why does chewing food speed up digestion? Bacteria in the food are killed, food are mixed with protease, the surface of the food is increased, the taste of the food is improved. So chewing food does help kill a few of the bacteria, not very many. The bacteria are basically unaffected by, by the chewing. Food is mixed with protease. Um, a little bit of protease is mixed, is um, present in saliva, but really not very much. Kind of lysozyme, which is a very specific protease, protease and well, no, it's not protease. So there are a few, few, few protease, protease in saliva, but really, really very few, and they're very weak. And um, because if there are strong proteases, and they just digest through the surface of your mouth. So it's not that one. Bacteria aren't, the function of the saliva is not really, and chewing is not to speed up digestion. The surface of the food is increased, so masticating, so um, uh, increased, so chewing your food, um, grinds up and turns it from kind of a solid to kind of a mush of powder, and that vastly increases the surface area. So the surface area is increased, so C is the correct answer. The taste of the food, food is improved. So normally, chewing it does improve the taste. Some foods, I suppose, chewing it doesn't improve the taste, but um, that doesn't affect, affect digestion. Um, Although having something that tastes better normally means that it's easier to digest and it provides you with more energy, which um, and faster digestion. Which process in humans does not use energy released from respiration? Cell division, diffusion of oxygen, muscle contraction, and protein synthesis. So the thing to remember that you'll be looking at not using energy released from respiration. And um, so diffusion, remember that's a passive process. As a process that doesn't involve um, use of ATP in order to or energy in order to move move items. So B diffusion is the correct answer. Cell division um, requires making more cytoplasm, making more proteins, all that requires energy. Dividing the cell, actually like dividing the cytoplasm and dividing by the, dividing that making new membrane that requires energy. So it's not A. And muscle contraction that um, requires energy in order to move move them. Requires ATP to contract these muscles. Proteins again requires energy like in cell division in order to make those bonds. The bonds um, are energetically unfavorable in the, in the protein, so to make them requires energy, which comes from respiration. Question 21. The graph shows the results of an experiment to investigate the rate of respiration of an organism at different temperatures. We've got rate of respiration along the y-axis um, here, and we have temperature along the x-axis. What explains the difference between the rate of respiration at 50 degrees and 30 degrees C? Um, so 50 degrees C here, rate of respiration here, 30 degrees C here. Um, and we see that the actual the, the rate of respiration has decreased. So that means that uh, the rate of respiration has decreased, which means that the enzymes that do respiration must also decrease their rate of, rate of action. So the enzymes are working more slowly at 50 degrees C than they are at 30 degrees C, and that's really because they're starting to, de to denature. So they're not working faster, because either that's really respiration has come slower. Uh, less oxygen available at 50 degrees C, um, that's not necessarily true. Um, we don't know that at all, we haven't measured that. Um, and then the same with more oxygen available, we don't know. There's no data about that. The diagram shows an experiment to investigate the respiration of yeast. So you've got yeast and sugar solution, and a balloon on the top, in this um, in this beaker, and a balloon sealed to the top. Um, at the beginning, the balloon is, is is empty, and then the balloon inflates after 24 hours. Yeast, sugar, and a new compound. So yeast and sugar solution. So we've got this new compound, 
is reduced and we produce gas, which is in the blue. Which gas is evolved and which new compound are present after 24 hours? So, after, if, so in this um, sealed container, we only have a very limited supply of oxygen. So only the oxygen that was in the kind of uh, the phase blue at the beginning and the oxygen that was in here to begin with. So not very much, and the product was a tiny bit dissolved in solution. But after 24 hours, after just an hour or two, the yeast will be used up all of that oxygen and started to respire anaerobically. Respiring anaerobically in yeast, remember, produces ethanol and carbon dioxide. And, and that's the whole process of making beer and wine, is you use yeast to make ethanol. And as a byproduct, you make carbon dioxide. Um, so the gas evolved is carbon dioxide, not oxygen. Oxygen is made by plants in photosynthesis and consumed by yeast in, is it all of it's been consumed, all the oxygen that was present in has been consumed by the yeast by, by aerobic respiration. So it could be A or B, we can rule out C and D. Um, and then ethanol is the thing that's evolved in yeast anaerobic respiration. Lactic acid is evolved, or lactate is evolved, um, the, the compound formed when uh, animal cells do anaerobic respiration. Which function does not occur in the kidneys? Break down alcohol, removal of excess salts from the blood, removal of excess water from the blood, removal of urea from the blood. So remember with the kidneys, they filter the blood, fill up with the plasma, um, and then they produce urine to excrete um, waste products. They do not have a function in an, an enzymatic function in breaking down alcohol. That's done by the liver, not the kidneys. So A is the correct answer, the one that does not go in the kidney. Remove excess salt from the blood, that is done, done um, by the kidney. If you have a very salty meal, then the um, kidney um, excretes salt into the into the um, urine, you get very salty urine. Remove excess water from the blood. If you drink lots of water, if you um, become overhydrated, then the kidney will just allow more um, water to pass into the kidney. Removal of urea is also done by the kidney. So these are all, all, all actually done by the kidney. Um, um, what is a urea formed from? Amino acids, fatty acids, glucose, or glycerol? So urea and the urea, urea cycle is what happens when you have to um, use proteins for energy, and proteins are made of amino acids. So urea is formed from amino acids, not these. What is not an effect of consumption of alcohol? Liver damage, loss of muscle coordination, poor cell control, stimulation of the nervous system. So liver damage, that's a result of long-term use of, of um, alcohol, and uh, long-term overuse of alcohol. So that's um, consumption of alcohol. Um, so that's, that, is a, that is an effect, so it's not the correct answer, because we're looking for what is not an effect of consumption of alcohol. Um, loss of muscle coordination and poor cell control, they're both things that you get when you're drunk. Um, so this is essentially a description of somebody who's drunk, so it's not 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 those two. They do happen. They stimulation of the nervous system. Um, alcohol is not a stimulant, um, uh, so stimulation of the nervous system is the correct answer. It's a depressant. Which labelled part of the eye contains muscle? So here we have the um, lens, the cornea, the iris, uh, the retina, and the um, optic nerve. Uh, so the the only place here that contains muscle is the iris. So you have little muscles here that help focus focus the eye. They can um, stretch and contr and contract. The, this is the lens. Stretch and contract the lens to focus. So you can focus on something close and then you can focus on something far away. And C is the iris, and this can get this 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 gap here gets smaller or bigger to let in more light or let in less light. And um, so C is the correct answer. Which method of birth control is based on knowing the stage of the woman's menstrual cycle? Condom, contraception, fill, diaphragm, or rhythm method. Um, so all of these first three work, well, the, the condom and the diaphragm both work by preventing the sperm from reaching the egg. Contraceptive pill prevents, um, the, prevents the woman from producing the egg in the first place. So they're not there, they, they work whatever the stage of the menstrual cycle is. Whereas the rhythm method basically means abstaining from sex during um, when the woman is ovulating so that there's no chance of sperm meeting an egg. It's much less, it's, it's less effective than the first three, but does not involve um, kind of artificial contraception. So rhythm method is the correct answer. The diagram shows some of the changes which take place during a woman's menstrual cycle. So um, hormone concentration uh, along the y-axis and time in days along the, the x-axis as we go along, the estrogen peaks and then drops down a bit. And then, and then after, after um, ovulation, the progesterone peaks in a progesterone dominant phase, 
um, during the second half of the cycle. Um, so at, assuming ovulation occurs at day 14, so here, ovulation, what is occurring uh, uh, what is occurring at the time of ovulation? So a fall in the levels of estrogen and progesterone. So if you look here, estrogen is falling, but progesterone is rising, so it's not A. A fall in the level of progesterone early only. So actually progesterone is rising during this time, so it's not time. A rise in the level of estrogen, so estrogen is falling, so no, not that. A rise in the level of progesterone and a fall in the level of estrogen. So progesterone is, is rising, estrogen is falling um, during this time, so D is the correct answer. Development is defined as an increase in complexity, dry mass, number of cells, or size. Um, so development is an increase in size. Development includes both the beginning of development. We start with a big egg. Start with a big egg with a single nuclei, which then divides up into a smaller and then a smaller cells, which just divides the cytoplasm into small, small cells. So these are my do some like, and then eventually we get this very this this ball of cells, which is really highly divided. Those are different cells, and then those cells start growing, and you get a bigger organism. Uh, and all of this is development. So it's both. It's, it's a overall. It's an increase in size. Sorry, no, I, that's completely wrong. Um, normally includes increase in size, but increasing increasing complexity from the single cell up to dividing and dividing the cells and then creating bigger cells and then organizing them is development and that's all, all of that increasing complexity from a single cell up to multicellular organism. Apologies, that's a completely wrong answer. Complexity is the right answer. In addition to a suitable temperature, what else is necessary for seed germination? Carbon dioxide and sunlight, mineral ions, sunlight and water, water and oxygen. Um, so remember seeds are stored underground, so sunlight is not that important. So we can put out these two. Um, and remember the seed contains um, seed contains both the kind of the, the information, it also contains a big energy store. The energy store is used, is used um, by respiration to allow the seed to grow and penetrate through the surface of the soil and then start um, photosynthesis to generate its own energy. So we need oxygen for this respiration and we need water because this um, energy store is still dry and you need water to increase the mass and the size of the plant. So water and oxygen is the correct answer. The genetic cross between two organisms may be shown as big G, little g, cross big G, little g. What does G represent? This What does little g represent and lowercase g? So you've got to remember here that in um, genetics, uh, uppercase letter, normally this is an uppercase letter, so our big G represents our dominant allele. And our little g, our lowercase g, represents our recessive allele. And so our little g is our recessive allele. Some fruit fluid flies have orange eyes and others have red eyes. If a two orange-eyed fruit flies across, their offspring always have orange eyes. If two red fruit flies across, their offspring sometimes include both orange eyes and red-eyed flies. What can be included from these observations? Crossing an orange-eyed fly with a red-eyed fly will produce a one-to-one -one ratio in the offspring. The allele for an orange eye is dominant. And the allele for red eyes is better red eyes are dominant. We can determine which allele is dominant only by doing a cross that produces a three to one ratio. So if two orange fruit flies across, their offspring always have orange eyes. The only way of having this is if you have um, homozygous parents. Um, so if you always have, for every single cross, if, if you, um, their offspring always have orange flies, they must um, both be, um, either be big G, big G, or, uh, Big G, big G, big G, big G, or big G, big G, or oh, little G, little G, little G, little G. So they must um, both, both, both be um, homozygous for either recessive or dominant allele. If you red eye fruit trap flies across, their offspring sometimes include both orange eyed and red eyed flies. So this tells us that um, the only way we can have this is if we crossed, say, so I'm going to say that um, 
the gene big R um, represents uh, red eyes, and the gene little r represents orange eyes. It has the phenotype orange eyes. And if big R is dominant to little r, and we cross a big R little r fly with another big R little r fly, then we get R, 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 drawing our um, Punnett square. Big R, big R, so that would be our red eye fly. Big R, little R, that would another be a red eye fly. Big R, little R, that would be a red eye fly. And then little R, little R, that would be our orange eye fly. So one in four, when you have two heterozygous parents, will become orange eyes. So these are orange eyes. Um, which tells us that um, if we're going to get only sometimes get to get both orange eyes and red eye flies, then if one of these was actually uh, homozygous dominant, then we would get no orange fly because this would be uh, yeah because because these would be all these all three of these would be heterozygous and they would have. Uh, they would have red eyes. So this tells us, so altogether, this tells us that the, the allele for red eyes must be dominant. And some of the red eyes stock must also be heterozygous. So C is the correct answer. What can be continuously recycled in ecosystems? Carbon, energy, and water. Um, so, with this, you kind of have to remember a law of thermodynamics is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be turned from a higher form to a lower form. Um, so recycling of energy is very different because very difficult because generating a higher form energy, a high, high level energy, so from like heat, so a very low form energy, is in, in, impossible or very inefficient. And um, so uh, so we're gonna have one with where energy is not being recycled by these systems, but remember, carbon is just um, all the the the, uh, the more main molecule that makes life. So, carbon when you eat something, it can be you're eating mostly carbon, and carbon can be recycled. Um, and when something dies and then is digested by um, bacteria and becomes soil, which is then reabsorbed by plants or um, uh, or, or or eaten by something, then it can also become. Um, or it gets or it recycled into carbon dioxide and then absorbed by plants, can be recycled into, into carbon and water, and can also be recycled through these ecosystems through, say, transpiration or um, something dying, and then all the water evaporates, or raining back down, watering a plant, coming back part of the plant again. So, B is the correct answer. Which diagram shows a pyramid of biomass for a woodland? So, here we come a pyramid of biomass, not a pyramid of numbers. So, remember with the pyramid of biomass, the primary producers are always bigger than the um, they're always a bigger mass than the primary consumers, which are always a bigger mass than our tertiary consumers, which are always a bigger mass than our, our top, top um, consumers, our top, top predators. That's because there's always some energy loss, some energy loss via heat at each stage to the environment, um, which means that you, can have, you can't support as large a biomass of top predators than you can of primary consumers from the same energy input from the sun. So A is the correct answer for um, all ecosystems. Which of the following is an example of a food chain? Carnivore to herbivore to producer, flower to fruit to seed, grass to antelope to um, lion, starch to maltose to glucose. So remember these arrows represent transfer of energy in a, in a food chain. Flower to fruit to seed, so that is the developmental process of a flower producing seeds, so or a plant producing seeds. So it's not that, that's not a food chain. That, that is, that's, a, that's a true a process that happens, but it's not a, um, a food chain. Carnivore to herbivore to producer, and um, so this is transfer. If this is transfer of energy, then actually the producer is actually the energy is being transferred to the herbivore. The herbivore eats it, and the energy is then being transferred from the herbivore to the carnivore. The carnivore eats that, so it's not that one either. Um, grass to antelope to lion. Uh, so the grass is being eaten by the antelope. The antelope is being eaten by the lion. This is an example of a food chain. So C is the correct answer. Starch to maltose to glucose, and that this is like conversion of carbohydrates between each other, so starch being broken down into maltose, maybe by 
amylase and some other um, uh, polysaccharide digester enzymes and multi being better breaking down to glucose. That is, it is a process that happens in life, but it's not a food chain. 36. The diagram shows the movement of water between oceans, land, and the air. The figures, based, the figures are based on an annual mean precipitation of 100 units. What is the total evaporation of the land transpiration from plants at X? Um, so if we've got 100 units of precipitation, or 100 units of um, water movement, and we've got 100 units of precipitation here, so 27 plus 23 is 100, we also have that if this is a closed system, so the water, we're assuming that all the water in here is staying the same and um, staying in here, it's not leaving or, or, or arriving, and then the evaporation plus the transpiration, in, uh, the evaporation from the ocean plus the transpiration evaporation from the land must be equal to the precipitation. We're not losing or gaining water into the system or out of the system. So X plus 84 um, is the same as 100, which tells us that X equals 16. So C is the correct answer. What is shown in the diagram? So we have a diagram showing fossil fuel being burned, transferring something to the air, photosynthesis, transferring stuff from the air back to a plant, um, plants being turned into fossil fuels, plants being eaten by animals, animals respiring and turning this thing back to the, the air, um, animals being dying and decomposing and turning this thing back to the air. So this is the process of carbon being moved around, isn't it? Because carbon is, trans this is either of the arrows represent carbon being moved. So this is the carbon cycle. C is the correct answer. The table shows the birth rates and death rates in four countries. Which country will double its population most quickly? So, um, birth rate here, so per percentage of population, and death rate per percentage of population. So, uh, so this is the percentage, um, percentage of the population, which is essentially having one baby each year. So the, the percentage of population, which is, um, so if you have a thousand people and you have a birth rate of 5% per, per percent of the population, then uh, if you have hundred people, then 500 being born each year, and the same as they here, four people being died each year, dying each year. So the thing we're interested in is if the country would have doubled its population most quickly, it's the difference between this number and this number. And the biggest difference here we represent our fastest doubling, the fastest increase in the fastest increase in population growth. So the difference, so I'm going to give us another column here, difference between birth and death rate percent. So this is one. 4.5 minus 2.5 is 2. 2.5 minus 2 is 1.5. This would be a 2 minus there. And 3 minus 3 is 0. So our fastest growing one is 2, because this is the biggest number. Which two gases can both contribute to global warming? Carbon dioxide and methane, methane and oxygen, oxygen and sulfur dioxide, sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide. So you kind of just have to learn these. Carbon dioxide and methane are both greenhouse gases. Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, fortunately reducing slightly less of it. Um, cows, for example, beef farming produces an awful lot of methane um, because of the way that um, cows digest their food. Um, that's why, why beef farming is so bad for the environment. Um, Lichens are organisms that do not grow well on air containing sulfur dioxide. Which graph shows the changes in the number of lichen species from the centre of an industrial city, the countryside 15 kilometres away? So an industrial city is likely to be burning lots of kind of coal, oil, gas that contains sulfur and burning. Sorry, my handwriting is awful. Um, and when you burn stuff that contains sulfur, when you heat up sulfur, you get sulfur dioxide, SO2. Um, so in the centre of the city, we're going to have a high concentration. So this, these square brackets represent concentration. It's going to be high uh, in the city. And it's going to decrease you go away from the city. So in the middle of the city, we're going to have a high, we're going to have a high concentration of sulfur dioxide. High concentration of sulfur dioxide means not very many. So we'll look at, remember, look at the axes, look at the labels of the axes, number of lichen species. So lots of sulfur dioxide in the middle of the city means a low concentration of low species. We're going to get down here. So it could be this one, it could be this one, it can't be this one, it can't be this one. So we can rule out A and B immediately. 
uh, C and D, and distance from the center to the, center of the city. As we go away from the center of the city, this one we, we gradually increase more and more and more the number of lichen species because they are um, and they are less sensitive, and then you get you also get a decrease in. Uh, so if I label this in my blue, not lichen, sulfur dioxide concentration, that's going to be decreasing as you go away from the city. Same with the cities. That is just a second line. Um, so these square risk brackets represent concentration. Um, so as you go over the city, as the of dioxide concentration, they're going to be killing them fewer lichen species and the number are going to be increasing. So this is going to be the correct answer. And here we have it, them increasing and then decreasing. This is, this would be if there's an optimal concentration of sulfur dioxide for, for lichen. So say here is an optimal concentration, then you'd have an increase in lichen species and then they stop getting enough sulfur dioxide. So this could be a toxic level, this would be more, and as they decrease, they get um, they, they, they don't have enough and they die, I forget. This is not what happens. And what really happens is that just the less gut sulfur dioxide there is, the better the lichen species go. So this is this is the correct answer. C is the correct answer. Okay, so that's the end of the paper. I hope it was useful. Um, uh, let me know what you think. If you have any questions about this paper, any of the questions, then drop them in the Slack chat um, for GCC Biology. Um, and I'll see you in the next paper. Walkthrough.